So what has, you know, what used to be on the lake and what is now, uh, I think, is for what, you know, based on the way I see it, now not everybody's going to agree with me, I think it's a lot better now because of the size of the fish that are that you can catch. But you have to fish completely differently. You really, it requires a major paradigm shift to go from fishing a largemouth lake and bank fishing to fishing Lanier properly, you know, to catch those fish. Anybody can stumble into one here or there on the bank. And, and sure, in the, you know, in springtime when the fish are shallow and coming up small, you can get by with fish in the bank. That's not a problem. You can go, you can go bank fishing and do quite well and even be competitive, you know, in, in events at times. But consistently, year-round, day in, day out, offshore is where you're going to catch your, your bigger fish on Lake Lanier. Okay. So, so let's talk techniques yeah. of offshore fishing. Yeah, sure. Give me your favorite one. My very favorite's top water, without a question. What we get a phenomenon that occurs here, you know, starting in probably late April through June, and then again late September through October into early November, where you can go to uh, offshore type structure, and again I'll define that as an underwater hump or point. Sometimes these points are long running points, and as a part of that, people, you know, there's a lot of brush that's been sunk in Lanier, and uh, there are brush piles that people have put in almost everywhere. And once with today's electronics, you know, everybody kind of put those things into, you know, and I've dumped brush in the lake too, but, um, they put them in so you'd have their own fishing spot. Right. right yep. So, and, and nobody really tells you where they put them, but with today's electronics, you're going to find these places, right? They're on, you know, these humps and points in key areas, maybe where there's a shift in, uh, you know, structure or, a, you know, a drop, maybe a drop off on the side of a point or side of a hump or just up on a flat, just, you know, near that drop, wherever. If you can, you know, read Navionics or read Lake Master Chips, you can figure out where these things are. And with the abilities of today's sonar and structure scan capabilities that like Lawrence has, you can go find these things. You can find these brush piles. And what Lanier offers is you can, you know, these fish and the bait fish will relate to these offshore brush piles. And if you know where they are, you can pull up onto that structure and keep yourself about a cast away and make a cast over that brush pile and bring wolf packs of spotted bass up that will literally fight over your topwater bait. And it's the most incredible, to me, it's the most incredible, energizing, just awesome experience you know to see that and what i really became to appreciate now is watching the look on other people's faces that have no idea you know why are we fishing in the middle of the lake what's going to happen you're out of your mind and when and the water blows it. up yeah. yeah and there's a wolf pack of them and they're fighting over it and they're knocking it out of the water and chasing it going on it's so exciting and like i say the look on people's faces uh is just amazing i had you know if i can divert really quick i had two people uh out from japan with me earlier this year tremendous people we had you know language barriers so we couldn't talk but i figured out to uh pull up an app on google that will allow me to you know we we communicated i could speak in the app and you know spit japanese back out to them and back and forth and we did this so we communicated the look on their faces when that first wolf pack came up and the veracity with which that those bass attacked that lure was absolutely priceless i mean it was just something that Man, that just made it all worth it. You know, that's just, that's why I do what I do. That look on the face, right? That like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe, just, that just happened. Just shell-shocked. That just happened, yeah. It was crazy. And it's just fun, man. That's, you know, I get energized talking about it. I love that experience. So, yes, when I can get a topwater bite, and there's other situations to get topwater there too. That's just the one that Lanier's probably most famous for and is probably most different from other fisheries. Um, is that being able to, you know, throw over a brush pile that has been planted or dropped in a certain area and, you know, work your topwater baits well, over the top of them and get them to come up. How about a couple examples of the topwater baits you like to use? <clears throat> you know, um, my probably all-time favorites are um, a chug bug. Uh, I have I have done some work with a chug bug over the years, and I, and I work it very aggressively. I, you know, I like to have that bait spraying. It's not just a simple pop-pop. It's truly I use it as a chugger, and I want it spraying water because that – spray really mimics the look of when the natural you know when that natural natural chasing pro, uh, process is occurring when the fish are actually up chasing those bluebacks um, that helps emulate that look and that feel and that noise right so a chug bug's probably number one and then uh, a gunfish uh, the lucky craft gunfish also sort of does the same thing it really contributes to um, that look that you often see and what 
you know, when the fish are actually chasing bait. And I think what, you know, it really mimics what the fish see. And, and that's really any day that you approach with a topwater day, you really need to figure out, okay, what are the fish looking for today? Cause it'll vary day to day to day. It's not going to be the same today as it was yesterday as it will be tomorrow. It's just not going to be that way. You've got to figure out what sort of presentation that they're, they're looking for that day. And so it's just like with any technique or, or any approach that you're going to take, I've got a box full of topwater lures, man. Mm. And I've got, so many options, excuse me, in color and in size and all that kind of stuff and in type of lure and action of lure. So I've got the ability to kind of dial it in to a degree of what do they want this day? Do they, you know, is it, is it windy today? Is it not windy? Is it, you know, sunny? Is it not sunny? And generally because of the behavior of the bluebacks, the bluebacks actually are attracted to the sun. They like the sun. It makes the zooplankton that they feed upon bloom in the water column. So they'll come up in the water column. They'll rise on sunny days. So believe it or not, your bet this is the other thing that really blows people away. Your best hop water day on the near, particularly like in a post spawn environment or here in October, is a sunny, light breeze day. You know, it doesn't have to be, I mean, it can be windy too. You just don't want it flat. You want to have some chop on the water. But a sunny day, those are the days that you can really draw those wolf packs up uh, on top water on Lanier. And it's, that's the other thing, like I said, that really flips people out. I was like, why are we throwing top water? It's one o'clock in the afternoon and the sun's up and, you know, this is not, yeah, it is. Watch this, you know? Well, for someone who was, who's listening and they just noticed you said you'd like a little chop, but not flat, tell them why. You don't sure. want that flat. Yeah, flat, you know, flat allows the fish to more easily discern, I believe, that the baits that you're using and presenting are not real. That, um, you know, wind provides or produces current, and current is always a plus. Uh, current positions fish, as I've always said. But the other thing that it does is it really helps disguise that topwater lure, right? It really helps... Uh, keep the fish from being able to discern that, hey, this is not the real thing. So it's more for a sight thing. It's kinda, light, like light refraction and, and all the things that allow, you know, because a, a clear top, the fish can get a really good look at that bait. Even if you're moving it fast, they can get a really good look at that bait. And you'll see if you try to work some top some topwater baits on uh, Lanier on flatter, you know, less wind days, you'll see them come up and kind of roll beneath it. You know, it's like they've started at their approach, like, yeah, I want it, I want it. No, I don't. Yeah, right. Gone. And, or they'll miss it, you know, they'll jump over it and miss it. Or, you know, something goofy will happen through that process that just is a trigger, like, okay, this is not the right bait. It's too shiny. It's too big. They're getting too good of a look at it. You know, a lot of times in those situations, just as a note for the listeners, I'll switch to a clear bait, a clear anything. Like I keep clear chug bugs, clear gunfish, clear vixens, you know, clear walking and, and chugging baits. That sometimes will get you through that on the really light to no wind scenarios. And they're still willing to come to the surface and eat top water. You can use that clear and they won't, and they can't as easily discern that to not be real. And you'll get hookups where you'll get misses on either colored or chrome kind of bait. Do you, so. do you throw your top water on monofilament? Generally speaking, yes. Um, you know, I'll do uh, braid to fluoro, uh, or excuse me, braid to mono uh, leaders on my spinning reels. Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of times I'll have customers come out, particularly in the summertime, that are not as hardcore uh, as some of the anglers I take out. So they're not really bait caster people. So I always keep several spinning rods set up. All, all my Shimano rods and reels are set up with... Uh, I use Seaguar, um, typically Smackdown is what I use, 30-pound Smackdown, uh, with a 15-pound Seaguar monofilament leader. So that's the combo, or that's the setup that I use fishing topwater on spinning gear. And on bait casting, I know a lot of guys like using the braid for the distance and all that kind of stuff. I've just, I've never been that guy, and I've, and I've tried it. I, I think the disadvantages of braid in terms of the backlashes and things you can get with somebody uh, that maybe is not perfect at throwing a bait caster uh, is really, because that can create an event where, like, well, that, that spool's done. Chuck that out, and we got to start over. Monofilament, you can always get out, you know? Right. And it's just easier to work with, I think, overall. And personally, I like the stretch, too, because a lot of people, even guys that know how to throw bait casters and are really in tune with it, They'll set the hook on the first splash with these topwaters. And you don't, that's one thing I really coach out of people is like, look, these fish might hit that bait, you know, three or four times before they get it. So you've got to stay very focused and very alert not to jerk that bait away until they actually get it. Because in that, a real, that's got to be hard. It is. Oh, it's incredibly hard. And it's still hard for me, but I've, 
I've done it so much that I just have trained that out of myself. But even if I'm not focused, I and mean, that's the issue is the focus part of it. If you're not focused, if you've kind of fallen asleep and you're just walking that bait back and forth or chugging that bait and you're not really tuned in to exactly what you're doing and a fish strikes that bait and you're not expecting it, you're going to jerk. Absolutely. I mean, that's just your, that's, that's how you're programmed, right? That's how you're trained as an mm-hmm. angler. That's your first instinct. Is he doesn't have hook. it in his pocket. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't have it in his pocket. Set the hook, man. He's got it. But in reality, what these fish do is they'll come up and bust on these bluebacks and literally try to knock them senseless because the bluebacks are so fast. I did this on one of my video reports. I actually filmed it at Hammond's near in, in the bank tank or in the bait tanks or near them. And I showed the movement of the bluebacks. The bluebacks are so incredibly agile so fast it's amazing how fast they work so the fish when they're focused on trying to get one you know blueback they will hit it repeatedly sometimes to knock it senseless and then it makes it easier to get so they'll come up and pop it but uh people aren't you know you're always tuned into that and um like i say you just can't you can't set the hook right when you first get it how how far up from these humps will a spot come for top water you know, it depends on the day and depends on the circumstances. I, I'd say 20 feet uh, plus because a lot of the brush piles, you know, people say, well, that fish came out of 25 foot of water. But, you know, the brush pile was probably in 25 foot of water, maybe 30 lakes down a little bit now, might be less. Uh, and they'll come up from those depths. But you got to understand, most of the fish that are active and aggressive are sitting on the top of that brush pile. And, you know, a lot of people, guys are, are, are very uh, ingenious in the way that they set these things up. They'll weight down the bottoms and they'll float up the tops. And so the brush pile may be 12 or 15 foot off of the bottom. I mean, you may be in a 25 foot, you know, water depth in terms of where the brush pile sits, but the top of it may be 10 or 15 feet from the surface. And those fish, the ones that you're catching on top water, are often more related to that upper level of the brush pile they're not down you know they aren't all the way uh down at the bottom of the brush pile coming up exactly from 25 feet but you know i think in different scenarios different schooling scenarios and when fish are more active they're likely to come from a greater distance you know their strike zone i think gets much larger the more active and the more aggressive they get right so and that's just that's going to vary day to day just like everything else so you know, but I'd say as a good average in answer to your question, 12 to 15 feet, I think, is a, is a distance that they would come readily. And I'm sure in many situations further. And a lot of times it needs to be a lot closer. I mean, it, you know, again, that all goes back to their mood of the day. And mood of the what day. We're doing. Yep. Okay, so you've got a customer out and the top water bite is not on. What's yes. your number two? You know, the first thing I'll do in that situation when the topwater bite's not working is I'll switch to a much more subtle presentation. And a lot of times the things that we've been able to do this year uh, are go from a topwater bait to a fluke. And a fluke is, you know, it's kind of considered a soft jerk bait, right? But you can utilize it in a way that kind of mimics a topwater bait. So we'll throw the fluke out on a weightless rig. I'll, I'll nose hook my, you know, the, the fluke, throw it on a weightless rig, reel it back as fast as now I when, possibly can. Now, when you say nose hook, Yes. So you're not running it through Texas style. No. Come back. You just hook it through the nose. I am using a one aught Gamagatsu drop shot hook, and I'm literally just putting it. It's like a circle hook, mm-hmm. um, and I just I put that hook through the very nose of the bait. You know, I start from the underside, the, you know, the, the, what I call the flap side of the super fluke, and start on the uh, at the nose on the underside and pull it up through the top. And literally, that's all I do. That's I don't have any other hooks. Uh, and I've fished it in so many different ways over the years, but I'm telling you, the action that you get when you nose hook a fluke is so much better than any other rig I've seen. When you nose hook with that Gamagatsu hook, it is so much better. And you, at least for me, if you have patience, the hookup ratio does not suffer. In fact, it's better, I believe. See, so yeah, now I appreciate you saying that because I've thrown many flukes. Yep. I've always been taught to rig it up Texas style, yep. pretty much, and bring it. And I can never get the same action, it seems, with each individual fluke. It's always something different, and I'm not consistent with it. So you're saying you this way is much more you will consistent. Get much more consistent. I think, you know, my personal belief is that a fluke, when you twitch it, it's got to dart to be effective. It's got to dart left to right, just like you'd be walking a super spook or whatever. It has got to dart left or right when you twitch it. And if it just rolls or if it you know, just kind of halfway works, that's not going to do it. I don't think that's nearly the fish attractor is, is that, you know, that throws of a dying bait fish, that twitch, twitch that gets you that side to side motion that is so indicative and the fish trigger into, uh, like that's, 
that's dying. That's easy prey, right? That's that's a bait fish that's struggling, and it's easy prey. So I think you get that that side to side motion so much easier when you nose hook versus any other hook style. I have learned something today, right there. There you go, Danny. Because I'm terrible with free the charge today. Free charge. Free charge All today. right, that's yeah, awesome. Man. Okay, so. The flute bite. So yes. you've got a customer with a flute bite. You, basically, you're trying top water, but yeah, just maybe work. just a little bit. So now that's not working. Yeah, right. so you go to the fluke, right? And, and you, work, you work the flute fast on the surface a lot of times and then let it settle. So it gives them something just below the surface that they can respond to potentially. And sometimes that makes a big difference. I mean, that really does. They don't want the loud thrashing of a, you know, some kind of like a, a Lucky Craft gunfish or the chug bug or whatever. They don't want that. They want something very subtle, and that flute provides that. Um, you know, if they're just completely not in the mood to come up, then it's like, okay, what level of the water column are they willing to commit to? What what level of the water column are they willing to eat in? So then you can start going down the water column. Spy bait is is, is a good option. It's definitely a more finesse uh, technique. Um, you know, it's a it's a very small propped bait, front and back. You throw out. Let it sink down, you know, 8, 10, 12 seconds, depending on what you're fishing and how deep uh, the cover you're fishing may be. And then it's just a very slow, slow wind back. Um, that's sort of a, a last resort for me. I I don't, you know, I've, I've got some customers. If, if the customer's tuned into that kind of presentation is okay with that, great. I'm going to put them on it. But I have a hard time just staying at that pace for too long. I Because I just... I feel like if I rotate through the options enough and I stay on the move enough, I'll find the fish that's doing what I want it to do at that time during certain seasons. Now, there's times a year that's just off the table, but there's times that you know I feel I can get topwater bites and topwater action when others don't, perhaps, because I'm really like dialed into the process. And back to the patient. And back to the patience, patience thing. Yeah. And it's that, you know, going back to starting this business is like just never giving up, you know. Now, I will make the point, you cannot force feed fish and you cannot go in a tournament environment and try to catch fish the way you want to catch them as a tournament angler. You've got to be much more versatile and you've got to really be willing to make changes quickly uh, or you're going to lose. So, you, right. you know, but in a guide trip environment, man, if I can get a few topwater strikes in a day for somebody that has not seen that, Holy moly, that's a game changer, man. That's a big deal, right? And that's something that, like I said, they're not getting anywhere else. They've not seen that before. It's new. It's different. It's an experience. It's it's something that's, you know, it's a memory. It's unforgettable to see that for, for, for the first time. Especially. Oh, it's awesome. It's yeah. absolutely awesome. I have these Japanese folks that were out with me that I referenced earlier. I have heard from them so many times since then. They've contacted me on Instagram, on Facebook. They said that of the whole trip to the United States, that experience the eight hours they spent with me on that trip was absolutely incomparable to anything else they just said it that made their made their experience and they want to come back and fish lake lanier again they don't they don't want to come back and visit and do all the other stuff they want to come fish lake lanier again. seriously it's awesome and that's got to make it worth it for you oh it's awesome i love to see that i i love to see the growth in people i love to see the excitement in people i like i mentioned before i love working on the high school kids because they're sponges they want to learn when they come in the boat they are eyes wide open and they are absolutely hey fill me up pour into me show, you know show me what this is about what can you know how do i what different way can i catch a fish that i'm not doing now teach me something and man they just like they see it and you can see it when the light bulb goes off right when it clicks you're like man i did something i made a difference in this kid's life today in something that you know he may end up doing the rest of his life just like I have. You know? That's awesome. So that's that's a cool experience, man. That, that, that definitely is lights awesome. me up. Lights me up. How about something that Josh and I witnessed this weekend on a tournament we were fishing? Because neither one of us are really good at it. And that is the drop shot. Sure. Now do you incorporate that I in do. Absolutely. And and I use Lanier baits, fruity worms, you know, the uh, I I know Shane talked about them on Fruity on his, Worms Rule. Fruity Worms Rule, Jimmy Harmon, he's one of my uh cohorts if you will and we do the uh, Gemini event together right. and and uh we try to support each other uh myself jim farmer and uh lanier jim Harmon. so yes i do i do the drop shot jimmy's really i mean he is an expert at that that is his thing he is absolutely dialed into drop shotting and that's what he does and 
that's his go-to. And I, and, and I respect that because he, he does learn some nuances of, of the approach and the technique more than somebody that does it on demand or on, you know, situationally. Right. Uh, and I use it more situationally. If, and what would be the, the situation that where I cause you? Where I can't get him to bite anything else. That's, a, <laughs> that's your last resort. That's a, you know, it's spy bait and drop shot. And again, nothing against the, nothing against the approach. Uh, it is a numbers catcher, and you can catch some good fish on it. But it's just not my go-to. You know, if I can get them biting something more aggressively that's easier, and again, that experience. But, you know, again, I'm happy to teach it, and I do teach it to people. People say, hey, teach me how to use drop shot. What's it about? And then it's, you know, okay, let's talk about the electronics and how to line up on the place and, you know, all the different things. And then, you know, the rigging of the bait and the, and the, present, you know, the presentation of the bait to get it to work and the do's and don'ts, all those kind of things. Um, I'm happy to walk people through that. But... If we're just going out fishing and we're trying to catch fish for fun, that's not always the thing I'm going to go to. I, you know, I can, I feel I can catch them other ways sometimes. But again, I don't want to take anything away from it. It's an excellent tool. It will catch fish, and a lot of times it is the right thing to be doing. But it's not always uh, the thing that I lean on first. It's not my first go-to, which is fine because I like having Jimmy there because I know. Hey, if I've you know if, if I've got something I can't figure out on drop shot, I know he he will know it. And same with me, he'll talk to me about top water and swim baits and all that stuff that I really specialize in. So you want to say you're looking for the aggressive strike? You're looking for the fish that's really to, ready to pop? Oh yeah, quick. I I I want the one that is ready to eat. I look for the fish consistently, and when I fish Lanier, and this is the advice I give to people all the time. I look for the fish that wants to bite. I don't care about catching the fish that I need to talk into biting. I'm looking for the fish that's ready to bite right now. And that's why I commit to staying on the move. Now, there are, again, times of the year that staying on the move and just looking for something that's not ever going to be there is not the right thing. There's times you got to slow down and really penetrate the area more. But I feel that in most situations, 95% of the time, the fish that you're going to catch, you're going to catch when you first show up to the location – uh, or within a very narrow window of it, or you're not going to catch them. You may see them all over the graph, but your chances of catching them really go down. It's kind of like the law of diminishing return. <laughs> the longer you stay in that environment, and the longer that the fish can get acquainted to the fact that you're there or that something is not right with their current environment, the less opportunity and less chances you've got to catch and fish. So you run and gun. Run and gun, baby. Yep. Yeah, that's, and, and again, that... It's not always the way. And there's times of the year like you can't really run and gun because you've got to spin to fish an area properly, like with a jig, for instance. You're fishing, dragging a jig on the bottom. Um, you know, it's going to take you a while to make some presentations and present that jig properly. But I'm not going to stay there any longer than I have to to feel like, okay, if I if there was a fish willing to bite here, I would have caught him by now. Gotcha. Right? Um, now it's time to move on and try something else. Okay. Right? So. 